Uh, and I have to say, in the interest of full disclosure, we just did something like this uh, at Columbia University with a thousand students. Uh, you do do this before. There is something special about the curiosity and, and the interest of young people wanting to know how do they learn from you, wanting to know if you were starting over, what would you do, wanting to know about values. You yeah. do a lot of this. <laughs> well, <clears throat> about the friendship, we met on July 5th, 1991, uh, and, uh, and hit it off immediately. Bill was a little reluctant at first, but he got there. And, and reluctant had, to come. Yeah, definitely. No, I, I mean, it wasn't for his mother. We probably wouldn't know each other. And and we've had a good time ever since. And and we've cooperated on, uh, particularly on the giving place, but other things as well. And and I, I have to say, it's it, everything about it's turned out well. He sits on your board. He sits on the Berkshire board, and 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 we have a lot of fun talking about a lot of things. And and but the big thing. The, the really came out of one of those discussions that really was the giving pledge. That, 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 that's worked out so much better than I ever anticipated, Charlie. I mean, I thought if we got 30, 40 people, you know. It, and and we, how many have you? I think we're at 156 or something uh, like that. And, and the people, and, and now we've gone beyond the borders of the United States, which I didn't feel would originally happen. And people are learning more our members about effective philanthropy. They're learning about things that didn't work. They're lear learning about how people handle within their families, wealthy families. And it's just, it's worked out so much better than I would have guessed six years ago or seven years Both ago. Both of you have made the point that there are a lot, because of success in technology, there are a lot of people with a lot of money who are much younger. Yeah, it's a great thing. Uh, that these companies are doing so well. And as a group, I'd say it's a particularly philanthropic group. I didn't give huge uh, gifts until I was 45. Some of them uh, in their 30s are already doing amazing things. Why, why and did you, were you, if the, the word is reluctant, re reluctant to give early than that? I hadn't taken the time to understand where the, the huge payoffs were. And I was pretty maniacal about Microsoft and only in my late 30s, with some encouragement from uh, my wife, Melinda, did I start to study it, talk with her about it. We knew we would do it by the time I was 60. But as we were doing that learning, we decided we should accelerate it. Uh, and you know, we found a lot of ways that we thought we could have high impact. And the principal sort of mission call was that all lives are equal. That's right. And a lot of that outside the United States has gone to... Uh, save lives and have kids grow up uh, to be healthy. How did you decide that you'd rather give your money to the Gates Foundation than create some foundation of your own and go out and find people to run it and do whatever you wanted to do? Well, my, <clears throat> my first wife, Susie, and I <clears throat> actually started a foundation over 50 years ago. And we, we, we'd talked about it since we were in our 20s. And I, I always thought I'd be rich. She didn't think I would be. But <laughs> and I said to her, if I compound money at the rate I hope to compound money, there will be really large sums later on, and you're good at giving it away, I'm good at making it, and so I'll make it first and you give it away. And she thought that was sort of half a cop out and half logical. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 uh, and probably told you so. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. And, and so we did something, like I say, it started over 50 years ago, but I really thought that there would be large sums uh, later on, and that she was particularly good at, at, at empathizing with people, understanding their needs, putting the personal energy into it, and everything. She would be better at giving away money than I would be. And she died in 2004, as you know. So, so then I had to rethink what I was going to do. And uh, so in 2006, I decided that essentially five foundations, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation being the largest, and I looking for people that had similar goals with philanthropy that what I had. And they, uh, the idea that every life is of equal value is just mm -hmm. fundamental to me, you know, with, with your luck, you can be lucky. And, and you knew Bill would do, run it well. Oh, of course he was, I mean, he was putting, he had his own money up, which is a big deal, uh, but far more than that. I mean, you had two much younger people, very bright, very hardworking. They work much harder at this than most people do in this country in their jobs. And and they were on the same track I was on, and it, 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 proven quantity. I mean, everything about it made sense. And, and and it's continued to make sense 10 years later. Bill talked about Melinda's influence. Uh, you have said to me about Susie, your late wife, I was a mess 
until I met Susan. I think that's understating it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, she changed my life. I mean, there's no question about that. How did she that. change your life? Well, I was a very lopsided, not well-adjusted person who happened to be very good <laughs> at one thing. And... And she put me together. I mean, and, and it wasn't it wasn't overnight either. I mean, but she just had that little <laughs> sprinkling can, you know. And, and finally, she saw a few well, sprouts come up. Was it a coming together of opposites, or no? No, I wouldn't say that. We had, we we had very similar values. We were in sync, yeah. big uh, in a in a very big way. And and uh, uh, but I, she was way more mature than I was. She was nineteen when we got married. I was twenty one, but I, I was I was about twelve <laughs> emotionally. And and she put me together and took yeah. it. it like I say, it took time, but that it, it changed my life. I mean, it, it, I would I would not have been had rough anything like the life I have had. And, and, and what did Charlie Munger add? Well, Charlie Munger, is my partner of partner. of fifty seven or fifty eight years, and and he's extremely wise. He's a wonderful friend. We've been partners that time, and he's strong minded. I'm strong minded. We disagree sometimes. We have never had an argument in that whole time, and we never will. And never had an argument. Never had an argument. I will. I, that's absolutely true. You, you must disagree on. Absolutely, things. we disagree. But so, we, if you disagree, how do you decide to? Well, what he says at the end is, uh, uh, when we disagree, he says, "Well, Warren, you'll end up agreeing with me because you're smart and I'm right." <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, where do I attack that particular problem? <laughs> but I'm and right, often he is. Often you'll he, figure out I'm right. Often, often he's right. I yeah. have to say that. No, I, I listen. I respect his opinion enormously. Yeah. Whatever he gives it to me, I respect Bill's opinion. I mean, it's. But it's, a, it's more fun doing things with partners. And I mean, the most fun is, is, is obviously a marriage partner. Uh, and that's the most important relationship. But, but having, having a business partner, if I'd done everything I'd done, it, it wouldn't have worked out this way. But let's say I got double the results. It's been more fun doing it with Charlie. <laughs> Who says no to Bill Gates? Uh, well, Melinda. Melinda's the one. Uh, <laughs> I've seen it happen. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's great when somebody knows, you know, when you might move too fast or be over optimistic and uh, you know if a team comes in and I'm pointing out things we haven't done and uh, you know maybe they're not as motivated afterwards so uh, you know they can you know, you know, get me to correct that. I've, I've matured a lot and, and I give Melinda immense credit you know she still has work to do but uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think I'm getting there and Complementary strengths where you share the same goal is a great thing. I had that with Paul Allen in the early days of Microsoft. I had that with Steve Ballmer as Microsoft got going now, both in my family life and the foundation, it's Melinda. How much time do you spend at Microsoft? I'm there about 15% of the time, and I get to work just on the R&D part, brainstorming with people, uh, thinking, okay, how we're going to take this artificial intelligence and make it understand, help you use your time better. It's a very exciting time in software, and uh, you know, there's five companies that are, you know, in a really strong position. Microsoft is leading in some really cool stuff. So like I what? look, oh, the <laughs> the way that a business takes information about customers, about communication with customers, looking at data. That mission of really using uh, data and AI and getting the productivity of all those workers up because they see more information, Microsoft is the leader in that. And it's a wonderful niche. You know, it's a multi-hundred billion dollar uh, niche that they're strong in. And that they will be innovating along that line uh, more in the next two years than than ever in our history. You have a passion for artificial intelligence. You do. Yeah, it's the the ultimate dream when you start working on software, is the uh, kind of deep understanding intelligence that humans have. So it's been the holy grail of when can the computer learn to play games? When can the computer learn to read? When can it understand speech? And things like speech and vision have made such progress in recent years. I mean, I, you know, you've been tracking this and exposing your viewers to some of it because I can't overstate that even for people in the field, it's a, a pretty magical time. And its potential is to do what? Change everything? Well, to, in the first instance, to be the best assistant ever, to look at all your information and you know, help you know in the few minutes between meetings what you should look at or when you're trying to you know, plan a trip, 
organize things and things to be a much, much, much better assistant than it is today. And then eventually certain mechanical tasks like warehouse work or driving, that it would take that over. But for intellectual work, it, it will just magnify the creativity and, and make your time more valuable. Are you interested in technology? Uh, I, I, I don't have enough. I, I don't think I have a natural uh, bent that way to start with. And I'm, I'd be so far behind, I never would catch up with people with, that have been working on it. And, and they, they, it would not be a game I it, would be it winning. It is a principal criteria for you understanding the business. Yeah, I have to understand the business. And there are lots of businesses that I don't understand. Some of them may be almost under ununderstandable and others are just out of, outside my sphere of confidence. But you do have people now that, that do have that kind of expertise or there you have brought in. I have two people who themselves have different circles of competence but they aren't chosen because they have a different circle. I think there's a lot of overlap. There's overlap between them and the important thing you know is not how it, it's nice to have a huge circle of competence. It's much more important to know where the, where the, where the, where the limits are of it. You can do very well if you only understand 5% of the businesses in the country. <laughs> <laughs> and find plenty of opportunities. And you know which five, you know the rest <laughs> that you've got, the 5% are in that circle. Yeah. I mean, you made a huge purchase in 2016. Precision was bought in 2016. Yeah, it was bought in 2016. $37 billion. Including that 33 or $4 billion of cash and yeah. assumption about $4 billion of debt. Is it harder and harder to find an acquisition candidate because... Sure. I mean, we got to move a needle on $400 billion of market value. And, you know, if we make a billion dollars, you know, we, we're talking a quarter of 1%. <laughs> and that's after tax. I mean, that's more than a billion and a half uh, pre-tax. So it, 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 it's hard to find things... Uh, I would do better percentage-wise if I was working with a much smaller amount of capital. How do you find them? Uh, it's it's interesting. I, I've got a call. I'll be sitting thinking, and I mean different 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 things. Uh, in terms of buying pri private businesses, it's because I get a call from a private right. seller. But uh, occasionally, I just uh, decide to act, and, <laughs> and and we never do anything unfriendly. But in terms of buying whole businesses, and but, but in, I mean, are there people who uh, who who know you and are close to you? on the lookout for you or not it, much it's it's not unlikely much. that yeah. <laughs> no. well, well, yeah. charlie we we we've net bought <laughs> we we've net bought 12 billion of common stocks yeah. since the election now the, 12 that's billion that's of in, common that's stocks. it's in my Thank mind you. which ones i pick now the guys that work with me the two fellows they probably bought a little bit or sold a little bit too but but those are just those are ideas that I've either come at it from a different slant in some way or whatever it may be. Is but, Airlines one of those? Well, it was shown, that, I won't tell you anything, we're buying or selling now. It was, it was shown on September 30th that right. we own some airlines, right. some stocks. And so why did you do that? Well, that, that I won't get okay. into it. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, uh, it was in large part my decision. <laughs> the old joke is, as you know, you know absolutely. How do you become a millionaire? Start as a billionaire no, and buy an airline. There's no, there's no question that uh, that it's been a graveyard for a lot of <laughs> a lot of money. Yeah. But transportation has been something. Yeah, both but, they, in but terms they're, they're not related. Railroad, the, the railroads and the airlines are not related at all. They're different kinds of businesses. You can't move. You can't move the track. You can move planes around, <laughs> and and you can't go into. I mean, airlines attract people just, yeah. just by the, there's a certain romance to it, like Hollywood yeah. does or something, and and so you can actually go into the business. And more than a hundred uh, airlines have gone broke, you know, in the last twenty years, twenty five years, or something like that. So it, it, it it's a different sort of business. How has knowing Bill changed or influenced or enhanced your sense of? of um, the way the world works. Well, I, I learned from him. I, you know, I like to learn from all friends, and, and Bill happens to be a particularly good source. <laughs> <laughs> but but that's, that's, listen, that's the fun of having friends, Charlie. Yeah. You know, I, I don't think I would, it'd be hard for me to be a friend with anyone that I don't learn something from. And they probably get kind of bored with me. And I get bored <laughs> with <them. laughs> yeah. Who's that guy talking about stocks? You know? <laughs> and Bill, what have you learned from him, being associated with him? Well, and an sitting on his board immense amount. Uh, you know, I, he wrote an article for Fortune magazine that I read before I met him about uh, that it's not necessarily a good idea to leave large sums to your children. So that was pretty fundamental. And I remember reading that and I, I was convinced uh, that that was right. And it meant, wow, now you have to think of how to, how to give it away. 
I also remember Warren showing me his calendar, and oh, I love uh, oh, you know, I had every minute packed, and yeah. I thought that was the only way you could do things, and no. you know, the fact that he. Uh, yeah. is so careful see this. Can about his Can I time. show this to the audience? Yeah. <laughs> this, you know, he has days <laughs> that there's nothing on it. That there's nothing on Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm uh, trying to show. Some of the best ones. <laughs> 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 Let's see. And well, this is October. It's very high tech. Be careful. No, here, you might here. not understand I'm going to hold it. I'm not going to show the thing. But this is the week of uh, April, of which there are only three entries for a week. <laughs> yeah, there'll be four maybe by April. <laughs> <laughs> File tax. So that yeah. taught you what? To, to, not to crowd yourself too much and give yourself that time you, to read and think and... Right, that you oh, control oh. your time and that sitting and thinking uh, may be a much higher priority than a normal CEO who, you know, there's all this demand and you feel like you need to go and see all these people. Uh, it's not a proxy of your seriousness that you filled every minute in your schedule. And people uh, are going to want to... Want your time, yeah, the and it's the is, only thing you can't buy. I mean, yeah. I can buy anything I want, the, 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 basically, but I can't buy time. Uh, and, and so, to have time is the most precious it's, thing you can have. It, I better be careful with it. Yeah. I, 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 there's no way I will be able to buy more time. And living in Omaha makes that easier. That makes it a lot easier. I, I for fifty whatever <laughs> the it same is, uh, yeah, fifty. Is it 50 well, then for fifty-four 40, years, yeah, right. I've spent five minutes going each way. Now, just imagine that was a half an hour each way. You know, <laughs> I, I, I know the words to a lot more songs, and that's about it. <laughs> it adds up, doesn't it? Yeah, it it really it adds up. Add up. No, if you're talking an hour a day difference, coming and going, and you know, you, that's. Two and a half percent of the person's work week. You know, that means forty years. You're talking about a year. Do you agree politically on almost everything? Uh, you know, a general sense that you've got to uh, keep the economy turning up. Uh, greater output and that you have to allocate it in a fair way. Yeah, that that basic framework we see uh, very much the same. Do both of you believe we can achieve a 4% growth rate? That's pretty high. Pretty but, high, yeah. But it, a it, two we just, like 2016, I think the last quarter was like 1.6 or something. Charlie, a 2% growth rate, yeah. if we have a little less than 1% population growth, which we probably will, in one generation, 25 years now, people have kids a little later, uh, will add 19,000 per capita, family of four, 76,000 to real GDP. So there will be 70, family of four, on average, there would be 76,000 more stuff per family of four in one generation. I mean, we are going to have more, and the golden go the goose is going to keep laying more golden eggs. I mean, and we've got a wonderful system. Well, but, but there are certain things that could could get in the way of that. 2%? I think we'll do 2%. Well, you'll do 2%. Yeah, yeah. and 2% will produce miracles. Yeah. But 3% is probably possible, isn't it? That, it may or may it about could this. it could be, but that's but that would be fabulous, right? And but two percent will produce nineteen thousand per capita. That, that's greater than exists in you know mm. a whole lot of countries. That will be added. The question is what we do with it. Mm. How do you see the future of China? Well, they've done a great job on some things. Uh, they're not a democracy, and so it hangs in the balance how their political system will evolve. But. In terms of raising incomes, uh, getting rid of uh, poverty, improving health, it, it's an unbelievable miracle that their embrace in their own special way of the market, uh, since really just 1990, they've done very well. And so they're the second biggest economy in the world. Uh, they're serious about trade. They're serious about clean energy. Uh, they are super important. The most important relationship in the world is the U.S.-China relationship. Clearly, uh, because of the two biggest economic powers in the world. And right, and they're rising. And they'll continue to be. Uh, <laughs> and to be. and we're, we're strong, and we're going to stay very strong. Yeah. What could make us not stay strong? There's a lot of strength that we've built up over decades. The way we do research, our universities, the way that people take risk, uh, and that's why our technology companies are still so strong, our biotech companies are still so strong. So the education system is one that you know, we need to go back and look at, uh, you know, and that is one huge source of inequity uh, because if you get a great education, actually the outcomes are, 
are pretty good. Uh, different. Yeah, yeah, mobility. Your experience has told you, your experience has told you that's much harder than even you imagined. Improving the U.S. education system, yes. The uh, dropout rate has gone down a bit, uh, so that that's great. But the overall reading scores, math scores, and the inequality hasn't budged much in the last 10 years. And one of the goals of our foundation is to, working with partners, change that. Uh, and, and so far, it's proven to be one of the tougher ones, but we still believe that it's super important and they're promising. If we look at individual schools, we see great things. So we still believe it's, it's achievable. All the talk about immigration, I want to talk about it a little bit, but all the talk about immigration, uh, are we still looking at a situation where some of the best and brightest from overseas come here, get an education, and then go back to India or China or wherever, it, rather than staying here? Well, a lot do stay. And the most important import the U.S. has ever had, by far, is human talent. Uh, it's been to our benefit that a lot of the hardest working, best and brightest from almost every country in the world have wanted to come to the U.S. And so if you look at uh, university departments or, you know, doctors, engineers, uh, people starting up companies, building jobs, it's been a huge strength of ours. We've not, we, we haven't always made it super easy for that to work, but it has worked very, very well. So the number going back, uh, it's meaningful, but net, we are still a huge beneficiary of, of human talent. But it used to be said, and Tom Friedman, I think, first wrote this, we ought to staple a, a green card to every diploma. Yeah, I believe that. Uh, now, is that you know a bias because I'm from the tech industry where uh, we can create multiple jobs around the engineer uh, instead of having to do that outside the United States? Yes, I believe that uh, keeping talent in the country is a great thing. Tell us the story, because you told me the story, and, and I didn't know it before. You think the second most important document in America's history after the Declaration of Independence, or perhaps the U.S. Constitution, or both, you know, is this letter? Yeah, it was a letter written by two by, immigrants. It was a letter written by two Jewish immigrants. Whose names and, were? And, and that doesn't sound like much to tell you one of the names, yeah. but, but in August of 1939, just before Germany moved into Poland, uh, Leo Zillard, whose name is not well known, uh, who was born in Hungary, but he went to Germany and he worked in Germany with Albert Einstein. And in 1933, I believe both of them left Germany. And where do they come? They come to the United States. And they become United States citizens. And they co-sign a letter to President Roosevelt. Zillard got Einstein to sign it because his name carried more weight. And that letter, which you can see on the internet, not even a full page, says Germany is going to, I'm really paraphrasing it here, but Germany is going to get an atom bomb and it may work. It didn't say for sure it would. And, and that we better get to work on one. And the Manhattan Project came out of that. And I don't, who knows what would have happened in World War II. A, if Hitler hadn't been so anti-Semitic, you know, basically, I mean, he drove out these great, them out, yeah. great scientists and everything. And secondly, if those two hadn't chose to come to emigrate to the United States. I mean, the United States was, you know, it welcomed them. And, and they, they may have saved this country. They may have saved this country. So the, the Germany did not get it and we did. Yeah, we, we, you know those V1s and V2s that right, were lobbed right, over right. there into England and everything? They didn't have the right warhead from the standpoint of the Germans. And, and uh, if, if we'd started three years later, you know, who knows what would have happened to remarkable men. And they were both immigrants. Uh, you sent me a note maybe a month ago, and you basically said, I'm not worried about the American economy. That's right. What I worry about is that somehow, in some way, we'll make a mistake in terms of the employment of nuclear weapons. Or some bad character will buy them or steal them. And we'll weapons of mass destruction are out there. Destruction. And the, the knowledge, accident, maybe it's a computer clip or whatever it, it might be. It's a tiny, tiny probability any given day. Right. But there are people who wish us ill. There are people who would like to kill millions of Americans. And and there's there's some psychotics. There's religious fanatics. There's, you know, <laughs> megalomaniacs. There's, I mean, the world has a certain number of them. And if they get in the wrong position and they have the knowledge and they have the ability, there are people who would like to kill millions of Americans. And the weapons are there to do it. I mean, when we... Einstein, 
Einstein said shortly after after the uh, launch of what was then called the atomic bomb, he said, "This is, uh, I know not with what weapons World War III will be fought, but World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. And that probability exists, and it's the number one job the president of the United States, which every president acknowledges, is to the extent possible protect us from weapons of mass destruction. And they can exist with individuals, but you don't worry too much about that, the intent. But with organizations and maybe even with a couple of, of, of nations. And it's the only real cloud on America over time. We'll, we'll solve the economic problems, but that's, that's number one. You, you agree? I agree, and uh, it's not just nuclear weapons. No. Uh, no. The, uh, bioterrorism piece is also quite daunting. Um, and What's it, the bioterrorism piece? Well, in an extreme case, somebody would reconstruct, say, a smallpox virus and have that spread. And uh, it would not only kill millions, it could potentially kill billions. And there was on the op-ed pe uh, piece billions. in the New York Times within the last about two years. I checked with Bill because I don't understand this stuff well enough. And he said, yeah, it makes sense that in terms of being feasible. And it, it, it was basically about reconstituting smallpox. I mean, uh, there are people in the world, there may be organizations, probably are organizations, that would love the idea of creating a smallpox and, epidemic. And how do you seen. prevent them from doing that? Uh, well, you, you want to have... Uh, surveillance to catch it as soon as you can. You want to have medical uh, tools where you can create a vaccine and protect people. Uh, science is working on the defense part of this at the same time it's, it's making the offense uh, slightly easier. So if we're vigilant, there's a lot of steps we can take to make the risk lower. Just like uh, minimizing access to fissile materials meaningfully reduces the chance of, of a, a nuclear weapon. There are some who argue that the next war will not be a nuclear war, or it may perhaps not even bioterrorism. It will be a cyber war. That's a, a third area. Uh, and I, I, you know, I personally think there's only the three, but <laughs> that's not much comfort. Uh, yes, the... It, a modern society depends on electricity and communications and information flow. Mm -hmm. And if you can, for a substantial period of time, disrupt that, then a lot of systems, you know, including how a hospital organizes itself or how food gets moved around, or financial institutions. Uh, you know, or yeah, an airline decides right. what, what to do. Yeah, or bank accounts, uh, you know, what was that bank account supposed to be? And so a lot of experts uh, in government and, and uh, companies now are spending time thinking about, okay, how do you minimize that? How do you have duplicates, backup? A uh, lot of sophistication going into that. Can the United States risk a trade war with China or with Mexico or, I mean, will that have a it's not a good idea. It's not a good idea. Trade benefits. Yeah. The problem of trade uh, is that the benefits are diffused and invisible. So you don't walk in and buy a pair of shoes or some underwear or anything, and it says you just saved 12% because this was purchased somebody. So 320 million people are buying things, the bananas come from the central, they're buying things cheaper than they would otherwise. But the, the harmful effects, taking somebody out of a job they've had for 25 years when they, it's too late to retrain them or anything, they're very specific and terrible. Now what you want to figure out a way is to keep the societal benefits and take care of the people that, that really are the, you know, they, they're the roadkill basically in this, and there will be roadkill. I mean, there's no sense kidding yourself. I mean, we have a text, we started with a textile mill at Berkshire. Half our workers only spoke Portuguese. You know, they worked in hot conditions, loud conditions, and they spent 20 or 25 years on looms. When textiles moved elsewhere, their lives, economic lives were ruined. And that is going to happen. That is part of, of, of trade. And the benefits, you know, 
well, if somebody buys whatever textiles we were turning out, you know, handkerchiefs or anything, they may buy them a little cheaper. And we've got to keep the trade benefits everybody, us and them, as a society. It penalizes certain people terribly. And we've got to take care of the people that are getting hurt and, because and we've got the resources and to And take it. care means what? Well, it means that somehow you have to have some kind of, you've, you've got to have retraining and all that when that's feasible. But... But it isn't feasible when you only speak Portuguese and you're in New Bedford and you're 55 years old and you spent your whole life on a loom. You've got to make sure that person has an income that's commensurate. We can do it as a society, and we don't want to. We don't want to let the individual case prejudice against trade and benefits everybody. But we also don't want to say because everybody's benefit, you know, to hell with this guy. And we're rich, we can afford that, and and we should do it. And that's how we'll get a good trade policy. Did you appreciate, Bill, the? economic insecurity that was out there that Donald Trump was able to tap into politically? No, I'm, I'm not an expert on political sentiment, uh, so I was uh, no better at, at seeing those trends than, or, or, than or other with, people. Or with Brexit and Britain. Again, uh, yeah. uh, I, I was surprised by the, the Brexit vote. Yeah. And the, and the notion of the populist uprisings that are taking place in a sense of, of feeding off of that. Well, there's no doubt that, that it, younger people and of, urban people in terms of their social mores and you know, being seen to benefit relatively more from the new technology and things that are out there, there is somewhat of a divide there. The fact that that would lead to these political results is a bit of a wake-up call to say, okay, what is in terms of economic and social issues are, you know, can we by uh, improving medicine, improving the education system, can we uh, take what the, the negative views are there and, and engage in a uh, uplift their views of the future? To me, the greatest surprise of all isn't how people voted because I, I didn't think of myself as having expertise on that, but this general question when you say, will your children be better off than you? I believe their children will be better off, but the fact they don't feel that way, that the uh, improvements in health and the, uh, you know, the new products that will be available to them. Uh, and what technology enables them to do and all of right, that. Right. That is a, a concern because if people don't see the arrow of time uh, pointing towards greater things, the idea of doubling down on more research and you know taking the best education and uh, getting that that spread around it it creates a a sense of malaise where you, you don't have the guidance to hey some things are working let's do more of those things yeah. but uh, the question i ask also is could america lose i mean if you look at today we have the best military we have the best economy we have the best universities we have the best talent uh and we have the best spirit of in innovation and creativity could we lose that? I don't think we would. No. I, I think the odds of that, of losing that, are very... This is a, what you call the special sauce. It, we've got the special sauce, and, and, and we've, still, we've still got a special sauce. If the rest of the world is, uh, is, learns from that special sauce, and uh, you know, it's, it's not a zero-sum well, game. I mean, that's terrific. That is terrific. But it, it won't deprive us. So overall, in aggregate, our society will be far richer... 10, 20, 30 years ago. And if you just take an aggregate, our children will live better. The real question is, is will it continue to leave lots of people behind? And a specialized market system will leave people behind. <clears throat> there, there is, if somebody is, however you want to measure it, 10% below average, there, there are opportunities in this, in this world today have not improved at all, you know, from... 30 or 40 years ago. Or, and uh, well, the classic situation is you, you take the Forbes 400 in 1982. Number one guy was Dan Ludwig. No, <laughs> your yeah, viewers yeah. have never heard of him. And he had $2 billion. So you know? Yeah, yeah, or, or yeah now, I mean, you know, now that the, it'd be 30 or 40 times that. I mean, 30 or 40 times. And, and this uh, a high, more highly specialized economy year after year different from that agrarian economy of 200 years ago, it's going to be more and more people at the very top winning big, big, big time. And it really won't do absent 
certain types of programs, it won't do much for the person that really doesn't have any special skills for the market. The, 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 the average person, or slightly below average person in terms of particularly market talents, is not going to do very well unless unless we have policies to make sure that they participate in some way. And the guys at the top policies are going to keep doing government. better. Pardon me? Policies from it government. It has to be government. Government yeah. is always... I mean, the market system is this traffic cop. It directs resources, it directs brains, and it does, and it does a great job of it. But if it, direct, it also directs all the winnings, it will continually favor more people at the top. Government's always in. I mean, government came in with Social Security, and government, you know, redirects uh, the winnings so it isn't totally the market system that delivers the winnings. But I don't want to kill the market system in terms of producing things <laughs> at all. We yeah. want more and more stuff, but there will be more and more people falling further relatively behind. And... That's not that's not a good result. I mean, we, we can afford it. We can do better. And somebody, yeah, I'm sure you saw this. I mean, there was a report, I think, last week and suggested they took eight billionaires and basically said they have more wealth than the bottom half of the population uh, the world, in the world. Yeah. 50% yeah, yeah. of the people in the well, world. Well, and in this country, if you took the Ford 400, they had $93 billion in 1982 and they have $2.4 trillion now. 25 times as much, not exactly the same people, but take the 400, 25 times as much as 35 years ago. And... Believe me, that, that does not strike somebody that's working 40 hours a week and trying to support a couple of kids on it and finding, you know. The, it, and, and that their income has remained the same or be is and, less. And, and, or and, that, they they just get, aren't participating. Or they're yet. threatened by forces they can't comprehend. They, 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 they can't. The market system just pays more and more. Just just think, say you're a, say you're a middleweight boxer, you know. I mean, in the 30s, you were limited to, you know, you wouldn't even get on the undercard at Madison Square Garden, and it was limited. But then television comes along, and cable comes along, and pay-per-view, and tens and tens of millions of dollars. So at the top, it's terrific. But if you're the 45th best middleweight in the country, it's pretty much the same as it used to be in the 30s. So the spread gets wider. If, if, if you're Frank Sinatra, you're a lot better off if you've got television than if you can just play at some theater in, in New York, like where you started. You know, it, it, It's magnified, but throughout. I mean, if you've got a good business idea, you can get it capitalized and become worth billions Easier just today. on the idea. So it, it uh, it's just tougher. Whereas... You know, you go back to 1800, and if you were if you were reasonably strong and willing to work hard, you were worth 90 percent as much on a farm as the very best guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it just uh, the differential, it, and it'll keep widening. The market system will push it in that direction, and but it's government is there to. And what would you change if but, you could? Well, I, w I would change the earned income tax credit big time. Yeah, right. yeah. Uh, I just you know I I am where I am. Not by myself at all. I mean, there's 320 million Americans out there, and there's a lot of crosses over at Normandy and everything else, you know. But, and uh, it just, I benefit enormously by having come along when I came along and where I came along. And, and some people did, and some people didn't. And there's nothing wrong with a market system that rewards anybody that makes life better for millions of people they want to get enormously rewarded but you got to take care of the people that that just don't fit well into that particular niche i mean if if this country paid off based on athletic ability you know i mean i could i could study eight hours a day and you know and, and have all these courses and you know i'm still gonna you know i'll get in the ring or something like that and 10 seconds later i'm on my back you know so it it, 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 it the talents that get rewarded in the market system are important because they bring us more of the goods and services that the country wants and they make all kinds of improvements in how we live just incredible but they leave they leave people behind, and it won't be solved simply by education. You want everybody to. And is it the responsibility of government to do something about sure this? Sure, it is. Sure, it is. That's what government. And, 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 go ahead, Bill. But the government, you know, also has to keep you know business in shape that it has the incentive to do things right. And striking that balance, uh, you know, should should be at the heart of political dialogue. You need more golden eggs. I mean, <laughs> nothing's going to work. You can have the fairest island in the world and two guys who are ethicists living on it and deciding exactly how they should divide up the palm tree. That's the only thing on the island, but it won't make any difference. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, so beyond national security issues, uh, when you, when you, what do we have to be fearful of in the future? When we've talked about it, some people believe that artificial intelligence offers certain kinds of risk, and you've spoken to that, uh, that it could be get out of control and somehow. You've spoken to that, and other people have. Um, what's around the corner that 
that will both benefit us. Artificial intelligence is clearly one of those things, too. Um, but also offers a scary world, whether it is uh, gene, gene editing or what of that kind of... When you think about these things. Yeah, gene editing uh, is a good one where the promise of helping with disease, making plants that are more productive... Gene editing is, you know, playing with the software of life, right, sort right, of the right. ultimate software uh, work. And yet, deciding exactly how it should be used, you know, if you could make sure your, your child was thin or, you know, attractive or uh, had certain other characteristics, is that an appropriate use of the technology? And so, society will Who have some... Who that question? I'll volunteer for the beta testing on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious, Bill. Who, how do you decide that? Who Those they? are government questions. Is it, government I mean, you know, questions. it's the whole thing about there's some, if there's some balance between freedom and security, and what came up in terms of, you know, even in terms of, of getting inside of, of, a, of a phone in which a terrorist might have left future possible terrorist acts, you know? Well, that's another one where... Uh, you know, making sure the government isn't completely bind to what goes on and financial transactions, communications, because you trust that the appropriate policies for when and how government's ability to see information is used. That's another one where there'll, there'll be uh, a, a big debate about, uh, uh, you know, some extremists might say, you know, government really shouldn't see anything. Others would say government should see everything. But I think there, there's the potential for a uh, best of both worlds approach. If, in fact, there's some appropriate procedure to get. Right. And we have had procedures. Right. Uh, and, you know, some people feel those the that even so some things went on. So they, you know, there are voices out there that would tend towards the, hey, let's not let government see things. And. Uh, that's another political question. How much do we do gene editing? How much the government has disability? Uh, you know, we need uh, politicians who really draw in uh, great opinions. You know, running a healthcare system and deciding when people are inventing super expensive treatments, should healthcare demand so much of the economy that investing in education and social services and those things, that'll be another huge problem that will be debated in, uh, in the political arena. Who has health care right? Who's got health care right in your judgment? The European countries. Uh, Scandinavian or? Well, the, the UK uh, spends about half as much as a percentage of GDP as the United States. Now, their system has waiting and things like that, but it's hard to express what a mammoth difference that is. I mean, you're talking about uh, almost 9% of GDP difference. You know, that is one out of 11 people who go to work every day are the extra uh, healthcare activity here in the United States. So. I'm not saying we should just wholesale adopt their system, which is a single-payer system. There are other really good systems that are not single-payer systems. Uh, Germany, Switzerland, France, they do quite well. It's one of the few things, access to medical care uh, is one of the few things that we actually do quite a bit worse than other rich countries. There's some like education that a lot of rich countries don't do a very good job on. This one uh, is... Is is where we're two very sort of uniquely things. bad. Healthcare and education, we don't do it as well as other people, other industrialized but nations. Ri most rich countries don't do that well on education, and there are pieces like top universities where we are absolutely yeah. the best in the world by a lot. Uh, you know, so that one we're more middle of the pack in in terms of our achievement. It's healthcare access where you'd have to say we we look particularly bad. Is there a ticking clock on global warming? Yes. Fortunately, it's not you know overnight. It, the really big negative impacts are in the you know thirty to seventy year time frame. Uh, although it, it has already increased the chance of drought and storms, and uh, you know we're we're seeing we're seeing that. You can see a direct causation there. Yes, the heating effect uh, is already there. Now, overlaid with that are is the 
Pacific oscillation and normal weather things. So exactly how much of it is the heating signal versus those other things, you can get reasonable disagreement. But there's no doubt that that's there, the global average temperature is rising, and the droughts, particularly in places like the Middle East or parts of Africa, we're already seeing some of that. And as you go out in time, it gets a lot worse. So changing the energy system, which has a long lead time of invention and deployment, uh, you know, I feel this is one of the uh, most urgent problems. And it is the urgent answer finding alternative sources of energy? Finding uh, that magic three characteristics, reliable, clean, and low cost. And there's many paths to get there. Uh, and so we have to encourage lots of innovators trying different things. You know, if you could take sun and turn it directly into gasoline, you know, that would be an approach because that uh, can be stored 24 hours a day and even moved around very well. Uh, uh, there's approaches that involve taking nuclear to a new level of safety and a lower level of cost so that that would be a key part of the system. Uh, you know, we need to fund a lot of innovative ideas, both governments and uh, private sector. Is your life today more intellectually challenging than when you were running Microsoft? Uh, that's hard to compare. I, I'm on a steep learning curve in both cases. Uh, you know, I, uh, I, I love the fact that I get to meet great people. I get to see things work, see things that fail. Uh, for this stage of my life, I'm in a perfect position. I couldn't be happier. Because you, you have an influence on Microsoft. I mean, not just being a stockholder. I enjoy holder, going over and, you like and the sharing idea of my dealing thoughts. With the, well, yeah. you, and, and they, you know, I get to keep up to date a little bit uh, yeah. because of that. And we're using some of those digital enablement things like to get cheap financial services to poor people all over the world or to look at medical data. And so uh, staying up to date on the digital piece uh, helps me do my foundation work. I mean, you've said something akin to this. You know, the average person today lives better than John D. Rockefeller did when he was alive. That is true. The richest man in the world at yeah. the time. Yeah. Lives better. He li yeah, uh, yeah you, you live better in, in, in terms of, of your entertainment choices, your travel choices. I mean, uh, John, he couldn't buy them. You know, I mean, and, and that was, that's in one lifetime. That, that yeah. It's amazing. What brings you the most satisfaction beyond family? Well, my most greatest satisfaction is just staying in good health. <laughs> I mean, when you're 86, I mean, you, know, you, know, you look at this a little differently. <laughs> well, so, but, you, so you, you're in good health? Oh, yeah. yeah I, I, I mean, I enjoy every day. I, I enjoy... But well, what is it that you enjoy? Well, I enjoy running Berkshire. Yeah. I mean, if you get right down into my psyche, yeah, I, I mean... That's what I want to be. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's you know, it... It's been my painting for 50 some years. I get to paint what I want. I don't have to, I don't have to do, you know, follow what uh, Wall Street is telling me to do next quarter or something like that. So I own the brush, I own the canvas, and the canvas is unlimited. Now that's a, that's a pretty nice game, and I get to do it every day with people I like. I don't have to, I don't have to associate with anyone that causes my stomach to churn, you know. I, if I were in politics, I'd have to smile at a lot of people that I want to hit, you know. <laughs> you just so, don't, you so just don't go to them. It's really, I've got a good deal. I'm, gonna, I'm hanging on to it. <laughs> <laughs> I often repeated this story. Brooke Ashton once said to me, I spent too much of my life worrying about what people thought of me, and then I only care about what I think of them now. <laughs> yeah. well, Brooke, I love Brooke. She, yeah. was, she was good. I but only want to see but, people that I like. Yeah, and my business is, is, I'm, I'm lucky that way. I mean, uh, business, business is so much easier than philanthropy. Philanthropy may be a whole lot more important, but in business, you're looking for kind of easy choices. You're looking for people that you can, that you like to associate with. And I mean, you're, to an extent, I can create the world around me. Are you me. saying to me, if somebody walked in your door and they offer, they want you to buy their company and you saw it as a golden a golden goose run goose. by a, with a farmer I didn't run, like. Run, run, run. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would say no. You'd say no. Because Even though you knew it would... Charlie, marrying for money is probably a bad idea under any circumstances, but if you're already rich, it does not make any <laughs> sense at all. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the satisfaction... I mean, what's the metric of satisfaction? Uh, I mean, it, it's really doing a decent job of running a place that... Yeah. that it's harder to do because of size, but over time. But it's, it's, it's working with a whole lot of people on interesting 
it's like Gene McCarthy said, about, I think, about being a football coach. And I mean, it's just difficult enough to make it interesting, but it really isn't that hard. Well, he had a way of getting people a little irritated sometimes. <laughs> what brings you the greatest satisfaction? What, uh, well, yeah, I family. think learning things and making breakthroughs, you know, after uh, all the great family stuff, that is a lot of fun. Every once in a while, if if something really makes sense and you can uh, teach people about it, share an insight, I think that's also very satisfying. You know, when I sit down with Melinda to write the annual letter, the idea of, okay, I've had a chance to see things. What could I share that is really succinct, uh, that might be helpful uh, to people? That That is fun. It's hard. Uh, you know, it doesn't happen all the time, but between my learning and being able to share where I see, oh, this is really simpler than I thought it was, uh, that, that gives me great satisfaction. I would say this too, Charlie. I, now at 86, I mean, I, I've seen a lot of people that have gotten older, and I've never seen anybody that is 70 or pick an, pick an age who felt good about their children that felt bad about their life. You know, in, in all my experience, I mean, I, I, you've never seen anybody who felt good about their children when, that also felt bad about their life. Yeah, yeah. and I've I've seen plenty of people with lots of money yeah. that where it hasn't worked out well in the family. But they and didn't feel good about their children. They, and, 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 well, or the children didn't feel good about them. You know? I mean, but whichever way, I mean, but it, it, and there was they failed at the most important teaching job they had and personal relationship and and sometimes it happens for extraneous reasons but but i would i really have never met anybody regardless of their economic circumstances who felt their life was a failure who felt they'd been if, if, their, if, if their children had become if, if they love their children, their children, the children and the children were doing yeah absolutely they felt good about what they you know they brought them into the world when they, and, their yeah, achievements yeah. And, and they felt like they had yeah. equipped themselves for the future yeah i i i, I knew one fellow was extraordinarily rich. He put a lot of money in his kid's name. He didn't, didn't want them to have any control over it. Once a year, he would have dinner with them and try and get them to sign their income tax return in blank. Now, just imagine that, you know, with, in this case, four kids, none of them, he, he wanted to have enough confidence in them or to have, it, it, it's just crazy. I mean, they, he would woo them during this dinner and they knew exactly what was going on and once a year, and the, you know, and then he'd bribe them sort of to sign their income tax return in blank so he could file and they wouldn't know what they had. I mean, that when you, you have adults, I've seen just time after time when people have been successful. I've seen plenty of the other two, but, but successes at business, a failure. And I don't think they feel that good about life.